Good evening. Welcome to this special program of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library, Museum, and Foundation. I'm Gleaves Whitney, Executive Director of the Foundation. You may have seen this special exhibit we are hosting at the Ford Museum. Uh, it's gonna be hosted there until May, 2022. It's called Women in Uniform. And when you're looking at the striking paintings of women in that exhibit, it may make you think of a well-known mural, Ionia Street, in downtown Grand Rapids, a mural of a strong looking woman in a police uniform. Well, the mural is a bigger than life portrait of Harriet Woods Hill, Grand Rapids Police Department's first African-American woman officer. This evening, we have the opportunity to speak with someone who knew Officer Hill quite well, her son, James Hill, who was born and raised in Grand Rapids. James graduated from South High in 1962, the very same school that President Ford attended. James went on to earn his bachelor's degree from Aquinas College and then began his career in the early days of the computer industry as a uh, programmer, system analyst, and programming manager. After 29 years, he retired from IBM and settled with his wife, Shelley, in Cascade, Michigan. In conversation with James this evening is our new director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, Brooke Clement. Before her recent promotion, Brooke served as the interim director of our Ford Museum and Library and was also the deputy director of the Barack Obama Presidential Library in Chicago. And before that, she worked at the Bush Library and Museum. We're very happy to have you here, James. Thank you so much for coming and joining us to talk about a remarkable Grand Rapidian, your mother. <laughs> yes, she was. <laughs> Can you... Can you give us a bit of history about her and her upbringing? Uh, sure enough. Uh, Mom was born in uh, Boyne City. Uh, I'm not sure how long she lived there. Uh, she did her early childhood was in Grand Haven. Uh, her parents uh, ran a uh, boarding house there for uh, the minorities or black servants that were servicing the folks from Chicago on the east side going up to their lake places. And uh, so they had to have a place to stay. So they uh, provided them uh, the home there. Uh, as mom told stories, the, uh, she was one of only two black kids who were in school as far as she knew uh, during that period of time. So she had limited exposure to minorities. There were no boys as she, as she remembered. Uh, she came to Grand Rapids in her sophomore year, attended Grand Rapids South High School, and graduated from there in 1940. Uh, then she went on to Grand Rapids JC. Today, they call it community college. Uh, <laughs> during that period of time, she uh, helped her mother, who was a worked as a domestic helper. And if you've ever saw the movie, The Help, uh, that kind of describes the kind of work that she was doing. She did uh, mm -hmm. that for until she got married, as I understand. Uh, she was going to JC to be a, a nurse, uh, mm -hmm. making 10 cents an hour <laughs> as a domestic <laughs> uh, That was pretty much, she married my dad and they were stationed, or he was stationed in Fort Leonard Wood, uh, Missouri. And in the early 40s, and then he got shipped overseas because this is the time of World War II. And uh, she came back to Grand Rapids uh, where, I, where I was born in 1944. She didn't want uh, a Southern state on uh, my birth certificate as the story is told. <laughs> that's, a, that's a quick synopsis of the early days as far as she is concerned. <laughs> wow. Um... So how would you say her experiences as a young woman influenced her, her professional life? Uh, that's hard to say. I didn't talk too much about that uh, other than the fact that uh, when she was assisting her mother in the various capacities as a job, uh, she did find uh, several of the, their clients. Uh, one particular she talked about was a doctor who actually paid uh, half her tuition at JC when she wow. was going. Uh, so uh, she was uh, aware of the times and the difficulties individuals had, especially blacks, but there are good people there that would also help you. So it's all a matter of how you carried yourself and how you presented yourself. That was always 
part of who she was. Wow, that that is that says a lot about her character, I think. So um well, your mother served this community for over 25 years. She and can you just kind of give us some background about how she got started in the police department and what her roles what varied roles she had in, in the department? Sure enough. Uh, she started off as a clerk typist. Now, my father, uh, he had gone to Chicago and he was uh, in school to be, uh, I believe, a called podiatrist or a foot doctor. And uh, we needed, she needed some additional income. So she became a clerk typist. Uh, those were probably their, some of her toughest times uh, when she did that. That was the early 50s. I think it was probably 1951 when that took place, 50 or 51. Uh, she had several ladies there that really did not want her to be there. I mean, as, I, as I remember the stories she told, I was pretty young then. I was in elementary mm -hmm. school. But uh, the stories were told after that. And I remember several evenings uh, once dad got back home because they ran out of money, uh, him attempting to console her and she was crying and everything based, based on the work that happened during the day. But she had a couple ladies. Uh, one would never refer to her by her name. It was always some negative term. The uh, N word was used quite often. Uh, there was also the situation where uh, three or four of them would not use the equipment that she would use. They had a spray, some kind of a spray that she said that they would spray it with some kind of a chemical and they wiped down the keys on the typewriters and any of the other equipment that they used. Uh, when she went to the uh, lavatory, the ladies room, uh, if anybody was in there, they would always leave or no one would come in while she was there. And she's also had only one stall that she could use in the ladies room. Uh, oh when it was time to have lunch, uh, when she walked into the lunchroom, everybody else left. So, I mean, she was kind of a, put in a situation where she was pretty much by herself and alone. However, she did have a, a mentor, and I believe it was a second line supervisor who kind of helped her along, schooled her, uh, was her uh, an advocate for her and uh, interceded in, in multiple situations as the story's told. And he was the one that encouraged her to apply for uh, the job as an officer and uh, help her, helped her along that particular path. And then uh, when she did that, she became the officer. And I think that was in around 1955, 56. And uh, during that period of time, uh, of course, there was a section of Grand Rapids, which was predominantly black. And uh, there was an officer, let's see, I think his name was Cole, Walter Cole, I believe, was the, the main man that was running things in that particular section of town, as far as officers were concerned. And he was a minority. Uh, Mom did not want to be uh, put in a position where she was only going to work in that particular part of town. So she requested to be assigned to the juvenile division. And that's where she spent oh, quite a few years in juvenile. And she had a good time. She had uh, some difficulties there also, uh, hmm. but she made some really good friends that I remember now, because now I'm hitting that stage where I'm no longer in elementary, I'm in junior high and going into <laughs> high school. Uh, it was a Bob, Barb Endress, and uh, I think it was Mary Hontime were the very close friends of hers. And hmm. they assisted her, but they also saw a lot of the, things that came at mom uh, during that period of time. So after that period of time, uh, best I can remember, she would bring home uh, some pictures every now and then. We didn't get to see very much and she didn't talk very much about the job. Uh, but I can remember uh, at one point in time, her bringing home a picture of a child who had been abused and had been removed from the parents, but the child had been set on top of a, an electric stove. So you saw the burn rings mm -hmm. in the child's bottom. Uh, so she dealt with a whole lot of different things that were kind of very disheartening. And it was mm -hmm. rough as far as that's concerned. So the, I, I know that 
uh, from conversations that she had, she had she gave up on the juvenile area uh, after a couple babies died uh, in the hands of parents where the child had been returned to uh, the parents uh, after they'd been removed. And it was the stress that she couldn't deal with that anymore. So she ended up becoming a detective. She took all the necessary tests and, and moved on. So she was always prepared for a challenge and uh, moving forward. She sounds like just a strong woman and to be able to withstand the things that she, she withstood, um, especially very early on in the, her career with the department. Like I, it says so much too that she stuck with it. She, and, and uh, I, I, it just, she just sounds incredibly strong and, and what a wonderful role model for others to kind of, you know, to, to look back on. And you know that your mother did all of these things too. It was just, this is wonderful to share this time with you and, and discuss this further. So- she, she had some major things that she lived by. And yeah. uh, she tried to instill those things in my sister and I. Uh, one of them had to be, and, and this is always as far as the job was concerned, and that is uh, one of the things I remember. She said, uh, being good at the job is okay. Uh, the, being the best would be the goal that you would have, but being better than the best, that's who you needed to be if you're gonna be a minority. I mean, that was one of the mm -hmm. things that she instilled in us. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's see, what was another one? There's no such thing as fair. Uh, I, you know, off time, the people say, well, that kid would say, that's not fair. And if you get into adults, adults will say, that's not fair. Also, I heard that. Her message was, yeah. there's no such thing as fair. Uh, and never let another person define who you are. You define oh. who you are. Yeah, so that one is great. Yep. Excellent. And well, she well, lived by all of that. So well, that. Yeah, lived by that. That's yeah. very, very true. I'm sorry. Very nice. Like I was going to ask what what you kind of touched upon some of the cases that she worked on as a juvenile police officer or in the juvenile department. What were do you know what some of the cases were that she worked on as a detective? Like any well, ideas? She, <laughs> well, I can remember when she uh, I'm not sure whether it was the detective stage or when it was in a juvenile stage, but I was a, a young teenager. And of course they had to go through some physical training. And I remember her coming home and practicing judo on myself and my sister. That was always a very, she, was a, she wasn't a very large lady, tall or, or big in stature, but she got pretty good at it. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun with that. But I know she was, she, uh, she was involved in checks, writing bad checks. There are several stories of when Vice used her out on Division Street when they were uh, dealing with the red light district. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know she had several trips going down to pick up prisoners in other parts of the, the country outside, outside of Michigan mm -hmm. and bringing, her back, uh, bringing them back to the Grand Rapids. But as I said, she didn't spend a lot of time sharing exactly what she was doing uh, on the job. I think that was kind of one of those confidential kinds of things that was part of the business. Well, it also sounds like she was able to kind of leave work at work and, and you know, focus on home and, and personal, you know, really be se separate those two. So, and that's, that's a healthy way to live life, probably. <laughs> you did pretty good at that. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Except for the fact that we were the kids and there are some things about her that carried over. <laughs> So, so well, I was going to ask, you know, what was it like to be uh, the child of a police officer? I really didn't understand what it was until I was probably in junior high school, seventh, eighth grade uh, at South, South High School. And you'd run, a kid every now and then would come up and mention the fact that they had talked to my, my mother. And what a nice lady she was, uh, or 
your mom is really hard. She's really stern. Uh, <laughs> but you know, that's that's what I'm in the what you're saying as a young kid and beginning to recognize the role that mom was playing and the interaction she had with people that I might know. So mm -hmm. that that was predominantly what was happening during that period of time from the standpoint of the discipline and the disciplinary actions that she had. She was uh, very stern, uh, very serious. There is a time to play and there's a time to be serious. And mm -hmm. There was no joke about that. <laughs> <laughs> it was often the, the grandchildren always talked about the fact that she had a way of uh, speaking to you that would bring out whatever kind of information she wanted. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. she knew how to coax it out of you, huh? <laughs> That's right. there, there was no lying. If you lied, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> I want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Excellent. Yeah. Well, you've mentioned to to us before, those of us on the on this event here, you mentioned that. You only remember ever seeing your mother wear a uniform once in the the time that she served in the police department. Can you tell us that backstory? Well, that was an interesting time. Uh, when the Ford Museum was going to be dedicated, uh, I believe that was in the early 80s, uh, the GRPD asked for all hands on board for security purposes, because they had dignitaries coming from all over the world to uh, for this dedication. And mom was requested to be in uniform, in a officer's uniform. That was the first time any of us in the family had ever seen her in what would normally be considered a police uniform. Uh, I, I know they had to go out in, I'm not sure where it came from, it didn't fit right in the beginning, so they went through a whole lot of <laughs> angst trying to get that right. But that was the only time she ever wore an uh, uh, officer's uniform uh, for that particular dedication. And that was not too long before she retired. So it was pretty close to the end of her career. Well, and you know, what a, what a great connection to tonight's event even. And it's just, it's a great story and it's, you know, it's kind of surprising to hear of a police officer only ever donning a, a uniform once in their career. Well, yeah, she started off as a, a juvenile officer who was plain mm -hmm. clothes. And mm -hmm. then she moved directly into the detective bureau, which once yeah. again was a plain clothes environment. So she really never uh, had the, the need to wear a uniform and of course, when we first saw her, I mean, there was everybody laughed, <laughs> <laughs> kind of kidded her about being in the uniform and she's getting ready to retire. But uh, yeah, it was it was quite an event, and we took a lot of pictures from that point in time. Uh, well, good. Oh, keep going. You no, remember? No, I was going to say that uh, my grand, my daughter, uh, who has got several pictures of her. She's pretty young at that particular point in time, but she's kind of proud of grandma. She called her grandma dear. Well, all, all the grandkids call her grandma dear. Uh, mm -hmm. I was kind of proud of that particular picture. The only picture that we everybody has of her in a uniform. That that's wonderful. Now you've you've shared some quotes of that you you remember your mother and you know living by, and I found another quote of hers that said where she was quoted as saying I came there to do a job and I wasn't going to allow anyone to force me to quit be working because of their prejudices once the door was opened I never allowed it to become closed so yeah. um what does that quote you know say say about your mother and you know how do you feel about that that being a quote she would have said well, it's, it's kind of uh, the lifestyle which uh, she lived by, the message mm -hmm. she lived by. It's, uh, that, that goes back to no one's gonna ever define uh, mm -hmm. who, I'm, who I am and what I'm gonna be. Uh, I can do anything I wanna do, or you can do anything you wanna do if you wanna do it bad enough. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
actions speak louder than words. He goes into that best then. Good, mm -hmm. best, better. All those things mm -hmm. all uh, applied as far as that. Yeah. There's many other words of wisdom that she used. Uh, one of the I, big I, ones that I remember she was constantly saying is think, think, think. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> don't all, don't react to emotions. <laughs> that I think we all need to learn that one. <laughs> and, so. uh, you know, the, another one was had to do with uh, uh, your choices will determine your future. Mm -hmm. uh, choices, relationships, and attitude will determine what your success is going to be. All those things had to do with walking into a situation where it's not going to be hospitable. You're not going to find it's fair. People are going to be against you, but you need that mindset to move mm -hmm. forward and stay safe wow. and succeed. Wow. She, it just sounds brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> I, w I wish we could have, you know, I wish we could have met her and all of this, but um and knowing how all of this about her, I want to kind of turn it over to like a softer side of your mother. <laughs> um, so was there a softer and a funnier side to her? You, you mentioned that she, she kind of tested out judo on you all, but I mean, what else would you recall about your upbringing with her and funny stories? We can look at it from the standpoint, uh, I was a Boy Scout, and she was involved when I started off in Cub Scout. She was a, a den mother, uh, and I, I don't know how she had the time to do that kind of stuff. Uh, but in Boy Scouts, of course, I was going camping, and my dad participated in the, in the scouting program. And uh, we finally convinced my mother to go camping with us. And, but she was not, she was deathly afraid of snakes and the varmints that crawl on the ground. So mm -hmm. to go camping, to agree, we had to go camping in jungle hammocks that came from World War II. Those are hammocks that had oh. screens around the side and a roof over the top. So she was oh. not gonna be impacted by the, the outdoors. Well, <laughs> that was an interesting, the first trip was really interesting because we were camping uh, at Benzie State Park and in the middle of the night, all of a sudden, we hear our mom yelling, something's bothering me, something's beating me on the bottom. And it was a couple of raccoons were sitting there hitting me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, was, that was, that's a little, little bit of fun there. But we, you know, we traveled, we did a lot of camping as kids, mm -hmm. as young adults, youngsters, uh, when we had vacations. And we went to what, state parks where, where we did predominantly camped at. Private parks didn't particularly care for minorities in that particular day and age. Mm -hmm. So we did uh, Wilderness Park, uh, Wanaman Falls, Porcupine Mountains. Uh, we mm -hmm. went over into Canada. So we did a fair amount of camping. Well, as the years passed, after several years, we got out of the jungle hammocks and we were in the regular tents. And uh, <laughs> she really enjoyed the camping aspect. Uh, oh, that's and quite often we bring some of our friends along with us to go camping. There was uh, also, uh, she enjoyed, truly enjoyed going down to Lake Michigan and we do mm -hmm. bonfires. This is back during the day when you could put a fire out on the actual uh, lake uh, in the sand. And yeah. we go out there, it would be uh, it's known as Norton Park, Norton Township Park back in those days. Today it's Hoffmaster. But, mm -hmm. but uh, we used to do that and we'd invite the kids around and, and we'd go out there and it'd be in the evening time and it'd be late and we'd have a bonfire and roasting marshmallows. Mom was definitely scared of water that went above her waist. She could not swim. She tried for years to swim. There's always stories about my wife. When we lived in Florida, they used to come down and visit with us in Florida. And I know mom went through several uh, opportunities to learn how to swim, but she mm -hmm. uh, sank like a rock all the time. She couldn't even swing across, swim across the, the short side of the swimming pool as opposed to the long ways. <laughs> I was thinking. But hey, you, she tried. That's oh, amazing. She, tried. I guess she, was, amazing. Uh, she was never, she was the type of person, you do not quit. 
if you start something, you take it to the end all the way. That was the way she taught both my sister and myself. If you decide to do something, you take it all the way to the end. Wow. Well, you mentioned your wife, and I, I believe that your wife and your mother had a really special bond as well. Is that correct? Very much so. Uh, after, they re after we retired, uh, mom slowed down and she relaxed. Uh, she spent a lot more time with uh, the last grandchild uh, because the first three, or actually the first four, uh, she was busy working. And you can mm -hmm. tell the difference once she retired. So she spent a lot of time uh, with the last one, that's Brandon, and uh, visiting with my wife. Uh, every Tuesday, she would come out and, and spend the day in the early, when he was a little baby, and she would go to, uh, bowling or she played canasta with her canasta club. So there'd mm -hmm. be at least once a week, and then sometime there would be evening times that they would get together and I know they had joined the canasta club together. Mom was like 30 years older than all the other ladies. <laughs> but uh, as, as my wife says, they still talk about what a wonderful lady she was. And, and thinking about it, That's and so sweet. someone mentioned the fact that this was gonna happen this evening. And about, about the mural, a lot of them, several of them were down there at the mural when that was dedicated. Uh, oh, actually. wonderful. So, yep, yeah, she, she yep. and, uh, that, that, that's the mural. She and uh, <laughs> my wife, Shelly, were, were really good friends. In fact, quite often uh, I've heard Shelly say that uh, she was probably the, the closest friend, real friend that she had. So they discussed all sorts of things uh, as we were moving through times. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's, uh, it, it was good. They, they have a good relationship. She, she, could be, she could be soft when she wanted to be and very stern at other times. And I, I think part of it had a lot to do with the job that she had. Yeah. yeah. She had some good friends at the, at, at the, uh, at the department, though. Uh, I can remember one of the detectives, I believe his name was Mike Skydema. I think that was his name. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know uh, they, he and his wife and my parents, uh, they did a cruise together. I know she did several cruises, uh, at least one, two before they... Uh, she retired and several after they retired, but uh, they were on the go. She, she had, a, <laughs> she had a, 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 a venturesome, she had a lot of venture. Yeah, it sounds like she really, you know, she really sees the day. Like she, she wanted to live life to the fullest as much as possible. Yes, she did, very much so. So, so you, oh, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. She, I was gonna say, she wanted us all to do the same, experience well, as much as you possibly can as part of life. A lot of us don't have the opportunity to do that. So it was always a matter wherever she went, uh, we had the opportunity, both of them, to want to mm -hmm. show us the good side and the bad side of things. And that's what mm -hmm. Yeah. Ahead, so you mentioned, you mentioned grandchildren. Uh, mm -hmm. So what was she like around the grandchildren? Was it, or was it very similar to what you recall as being her child? <laughs> well, I think that they had a little bit better than I did. They did a lot of practicing uh, as it was going on. Of course, they weren't living with her on a day to day basis. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was a big difference. You know, it's, it's hard to tell exactly how they really felt because I can't see they want to put their rant at particular point in time. But I do know they, they provided them with some special drink. I'm going to take you to the, excuse me, the first three uh, got to go down to the point for them several different years. And that was quite an event. And before they went to Cedar Point, she would always take them up to the, the they had a place in Woodland Park, which was late. Uh, and they would spend uh, time up there uh, getting adjusted to the day. Grandma, you and Grandpa. Because mom and dad didn't approach the same uh, thing. And then they would take them down to see the point and then they would take them down. Then they would go home. 
Dr. Leo had a different uh, attitude about it. I can remember uh, they uh, they were putting some new cement forms and they poured some cement and the kids walked down and stuck their foot in the fresh cement. And those are, it's really funny because it, it comes back to look at it and they were, you know, they were, I don't think anybody was over six years old. So they were pretty young at that point in time. Mm -hmm. They laugh about that. I remember when you <laughs> did that and, and granddad was mad. <laughs> and grandma saved us. <laughs> that that's really wonderful. Now, and speaking of your father, Ben, your your parents were married for sixty three years. How did your your father feel about your mom working as a police officer and a detective? Well, I, I don't think there was ever an issue where, as far as mom's job was concerned. Uh, mm -hmm. They operated pretty much as a team in everything they did, as far as raising kids, as far as interacting with the uh, grandchildren, uh, their friends, uh, as far as church was concerned. They, mm -hmm. uh, as, as I look back on who they were as individuals and what they went through as far as their careers, I look at them as trailblazers or pioneers for Grand Rapids is concerned. And I say that from the standpoint of, if you think about the pioneers that went into the Old West, uh, blazing trails that others come behind them, and they were in hostile territory, territory that was not hostile. Uh, Mom and Dad did pretty much the same thing here in, in Grand Rapids. She was like the first female uh, officer. She was mm -hmm. also uh, African American uh, in an all white environment. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, someone may have to verify this part, but when she came in as a clerk typist, she was the second clerk typist, as I understand, yeah, for the city. Then the first mm -hmm. one, who I knew as a child, uh, was very fair that she passed white. Uh, mm -hmm. Dad worked for uh, Rapistan, which was a conveyor today that's referred to as the Maddox, and he was the first black that was in the office environment. So both of them were mm -hmm. blazing trails for folks to come behind them. Uh, you had to uh, act a particular way, you had to think yourself in a particular way, and, mm -hmm. and be who you needed to be to survive in that particular because it was their environment, it was not. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they, they got along real well. And they teamed up on the kids off. Mom would always say, go give me a switch and we'll wait till dad gets home. <laughs> it hurt me worse than hurt you. <laughs> oh, these are such fantastic, you know, reminiscences. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, so you, you touched a little bit on things that she did after retiring. Did she, it sounds like she still kept in touch with a lot of the, the police department after she retired, or at least, you know, good friends of hers in the police department. Uh, what was life like for her in retirement? Well, best I can tell, there were a few years uh, that we were living in South Florida. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the first year she retired, and they would come down and visit us, and probably stay about two months. And oh, wow. uh, <laughs> well, that would be the winter time. Yes, <laughs> so, <no word. laughs> yeah, they, they didn't particularly care for the cold. <laughs> the summer was pretty hot, but uh, they come down and, and spend time with us. And uh, our time with uh, with my wife, uh, she would be working. And, Fix the meals, and then we come home and have meals, and then they'd spend time in the pool together because they were with kids. They had opportunity to do that. They go shopping. They had their favorite places that they go shopping. One of her uh, favorite places was Bojangles, I think the name of it was, when she was down there. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, when they were home, they spent a fair amount of time up at the lake, 
and they had a whole series of friends. And a lot of those folks were, uh, as I would call them, pioneers. One of the people I really remember quite often was uh, Dave King, who was a uh, the first black fireman in Grand Rapids. Okay. So there were a few folks in those days that were the pioneers uh, uh, as far wow. as the was concerned. And, and of course, when we moved back to Grand Rapids, that was the point in time when the last grandchild came about. And so she spent a fair amount of time getting to know him and spending uh, valuable time in, in forming who he has become as an uh -huh. individual. And, you know, it was, it, it was, I think it was good for, she, for her. She played a lot of golf. Oh. And she became a competitive bridge player and then went into duplicate bridge. And she had a pretty high rating uh, by the time she uh, passed away. Uh, and wow. of course my, my dad suffered with uh, dementia in the, mm -hmm. in the latter days. And she spent a fair amount of time. Uh, <laughs> actually, we didn't even know he was, he was having problems because she covered it up so well. Uh. <laughs> Like I said, they were a team and they operated really yeah. well together. So, wow. but retirement was, I, I think she really enjoyed retirement. She didn't have the stress and the pressure that she had from the job and she could relax and enjoy time with her friends and her family and doing the things that uh, she really enjoyed doing. She learned, she, she learned how to sew. She and my wife would, uh, did a what? lot of sewing in I can't remember the term of it, but I know that she, uh, the two of them put together a whole set of drapes, drapery for okay. the house okay. on Morris Street. So, yep. Wow. It sounds like she just lived every day to the fullest. And that's, that is just, you know, that's it's very, did. it's very impactful. And she, tried to, she tried to prepare children, my sister and I, as well as the grandchildren but what they were going to deal with as far as the future was concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, recognizing that uh, we were African-American and mm -hmm. the doors weren't always open to you. And as you, as you mentioned in one of her statements, once the door is open, don't let it close. Stick mm -hmm. your foot in there and keep it open and keep pushing forward. Take advantage of every opportunity that's, that's put in front of you. So, I mean, yeah. she tried to make sure we understood what it was all about. Mm -hmm. Along was wherever you go, there's going to be good people and bad people. You're going to find them in the job, you're going to find them in the church, you're going to find them in the schools, you're going to find them in the police department. Just remember, good people and bad people, wherever you go, you have the thought filter to identify who are the good. So stay away from the bad people. Wow. Yeah. Such, you know, brilliant. Again, she's such a smart, smart woman. And yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's not much I can say after that. <laughs> um, so I, I know that somebody brought on the, the photo of the mural and I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about the mural. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe we can bring that mural back up. Okay, there it is. So in September 2021, uh, the the mural was unveiled. This is right outside the Grand Rapids Police Department, and it's mm -hmm. part of the Women's Way mural series uh, around town. And so, just wanted to to get your take on the mural. Jasmine Bruce, who was the artist of the mural, said that symbolism flows through this piece as waves pay ode to Harriet's hometown, leading to the old time Grand Rapids cityscape. The lotus flowers symbolize her growth out of muddy waters, all the while soaring above. And mm -hmm. based on some of the things that you've mentioned throughout the, this evening's program, it sounds like that, at least that symbolism that Jasmine Bruce was really looking for is, is indicative of how she lived her life. Yes, very much so. I think Jasmine did an excellent job as far as interpreting uh, who mom was with, with her symbolism uh, in the various pieces that that's there. Uh, 
the, the plan, I, I know she had uh, the original design that she had, uh, which was already in process as she was already putting the paint on the wall. Uh, there's a, somewhat of a smirk you find on mom's face that originally wasn't there as when I first saw it. And I said, you know, she had a little bit more of a smile <laughs> with a little bit more personality. So that, I, I, I look at that and I say, yeah, it, it, you know, it's, uh, it's a, a likeness that she came up with based on pictures. She did not have the opportunity to really sit down and talk to mom to uh, have a, a true interpretation of who she was as an individual. So, you know, this is a rendition of who she felt. And she's wearing a police, a and police she has, uniform. Yeah, she has, she has a uniform on. <laughs> 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 that, that fits with the fact that if you're going to be recognized as a, as a police department, from a, a matter of a police mm -hmm. officer, that you do couldn't have somebody in plain clothes and anybody rec really recognize what the symbol mm -hmm. is supposed to be there. Oh well, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's quite uh, appropriate and it's uh, something that I hope will be around for a long time and uh, recognizes her as an individual and the role she has played within the community and hopefully that others will follow in behind and take some of the things that she has done in the past. You know, it, it, it's, it's kind of funny because at the funeral, there were several people that came up and, and the kids talk about it uh, that mentioned the fact that, you know, uh, you're, if it wasn't for your mother, I may not even have been here. And they're talking about when they were kids as, and mm -hmm. she was a juvenile officer at that point. In time. But uh, she was always more concerned about what was happening to the children and how they were being treated and how they would end up in their lifetime as opposed to the adults. Adults have already typically where they're going to be. What the children are, they are pliable, they're like clay. Mm. Got to be the right person, giving them the right message so they can move on. Yep. Mm. Quite I a, imagine that see, you know, meeting those, those now adults that she had impacted as children uh, was was really just very special moments for you and your family during that time. Yes, indeed, very much so. Yeah. Very, very much so. Some of the children have made that comment in regards to mm -hmm. the impact of other people they've, they have known who are now adults. And, and, and even some of the, uh, I think was an officer, a couple of the officers that uh, mom dealt with as uh, youngsters. Mm -hmm. GRPD. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it's good to know that uh, she had an impact on a lot of people and did put a blaze of trail for others. Mm -hmm. And there's there's been quite a few successful uh, minority police officers in mm -hmm. the GRPD. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll ask a final question and then we'll We'll bring Gleaves back on, and he'll ask you a one more question as well. <laughs> but I, 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 I she, it's very clear that your mother's story impacts the next generation, and I just wanted to, I wanted to get the your take and what your family's take is on the recognition that she's getting now, and um, uh, what that what that means to you all. Well, you, you know, it's it's a it's really a good feeling uh, to see her being honored uh, in this particular way. Uh, never anticipating this was ever going to happen. I can remember the first time when the when the organization started doing the the, the, the special uh, recognition of the women who made contributions to the Grand Rapids community. And uh, I was somewhat surprised that they even brought my mother's name up in, the, in that particular situation. But uh, I do know she played a, a significant role in many ways. And mm -hmm. it, it's good to see that other folks are looking back and recognizing that there were some true trailblazers uh, who made a significant impact 
on things that are going on today and enabling the, the, the youngsters and the youth. And some of us are no longer youngsters anymore. <laughs> but uh, it's, it, it, it's a real good feeling to, to find her being honored as the individual mm -hmm. that we saw her and we knew her as. And now mm -hmm. other people have the opportunity to uh, recognize and acknowledge that things have changed and it's individuals like her uh, are responsible or initiated the changes because things are very different than what they used to be. And now they're not great yet. They got, we got a long ways to go. We do, <laughs> we do. To what they were, compared to what they were. <laughs> no, I, I could not have said it better. You, <laughs> your, you and your family, your mother, you're such inspirations and I appreciate you coming on tonight. And I'm gonna turn it over to Gleaves here for our final, final question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, there are so many, so many good uh, observations and comments. I could listen to you two continue to talk all night. But James, I do want to ask, you know, a lot of students are watching, I think, and, and these students are looking for what are the great leadership qualities that a person needs to have to excel in life. And I think you've talked about them, but let's, let's reframe sort of your mom's achievements in terms of being a, a leader. Uh, you said being better than the best was what was required of an African-American or minority uh, in the society in the 50s and 60s. And so there's a certain toughness there. And I wonder if you could elaborate for our younger audience, what were the great leadership qualities that your mom possessed? Uh, wow. As, as I look at her, and I'm going back with the past, uh, there were several different things that I, that I consider the, the the leadership qualities. And uh, one of the big ones is treating each person as an individual and the way they operate. Everybody has the opportunity to think the way they, they think, but you have to make your own decisions and choices as far as things are concerned. Uh, what you believe to be true is, is going to determine uh, the way you think and your mindset that's going to determine your actions and your habits and your choices and your attitude. And that's going to determine how well you do in life. So, I mean, you got to make your choices and decisions. Every choice you can make, there's repercussions associated with it. And uh, believe it or not, the, the world is going to change. And like I said before, her, one of her big things is a lot of people think, well, that's not fair. And she kept she, I mean, that was one thing she harped on for us, my sister and I is, there's no, there's no such thing as fair. Uh, you got to make it on your own. How well, what you, how you succeed is going to be totally up to you. So there, there's, that's probably the best thing I can say as far as leadership is concerned, is really go for it. Never stop. Once you, once you start something, uh, don't quit. Uh, be true to yourself, be fair to people. I mean, there, there's that term fair. <laughs> uh, treat them with, treat the individuals as equals. It's, it's hard to say. There were so many things as I look back on my mom and, and the role that she played and the way she interacted with individuals that uh, leadership is, is not a man, matter of managing people, but bringing out the best a person has to offer and exposing them or sharing with them uh, the qualities that are needed to succeed. And that's about the best as I can tell, <laughs> best I can say at this stage. <laughs> you give me a few minutes and I'll come up with some more. <laughs> Now, those are wonderful words on which to close. I want to thank you, James Hill and Brooke Clement, my colleague, for this evening's warm-hearted conversation that introduced us to, to your mom, Detective Harriet Woods Hill. And now we know the story, some of the stories behind this remarkable woman in your life and in the mural that we can see down there by the police department here on Ionia Street. 
Well, programs like this evening's are what make the Ford a truly special place. And if your mind was enriched by this evening's conversation, if your perspective was challenged, then we hosted a successful program. And we hope that you will consider becoming a friend of Ford. To sign up and see our upcoming programs and exhibits, including the very special Sistine Chapel exhibit coming in May, please visit our website at geraldrfordfoundation.org. There you will find an array of resources to learn more about our 38th president and his virtue anchored leadership, which is very much needed in America today. Please consider joining us in this important work that we do. Thank you and good night.